for our next speaker, uh, I would like to welcome up Andrew Hill from Tableland. Uh, Table, Andrew's a longtime veteran of the Filecoin world here. And um, he's, um, he's, you guys actually just completed a round, um, so congratulations on that, very exciting. Um, so Andrew's gonna be telling us about uh, what Tableland is doing um, with relational databases and kind of how this all integrates into FVM. You have some exciting new uh, things to tell us from what I understand. Yeah, so. Oh, sorry. I'm <laughs> anyway, take it away. Uh, cool. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. Um, I just recalled when I was sitting here, well, first of all, I've had a couple conversations about the Filecoin swag always being the best swag. And we don't have much swag, but I actually have stickers. So all the people I've been talking to, come grab a sticker from me afterwards. But yeah, so I'm, I'm Andrew. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you today about Tableland. I thought I'd probably just start by telling you what Tableland is, because I think a lot of people are aware of roughly what Tableland is, is doing, but not really how it works or what it's solving yet, and um, definitely not where we're heading next. So Tableland at, at the high level, at, at, for this audience, you can think of it like a relational database for people building on the FVM. Um, actually, that, that gets to the news that I'll talk about later uh, as well and how you, how you can start tapping into the, what Tableland does. But in the, in the process of building Tableland at the beginning, we really identified this gap that exists in most Web3 developers stack where you have all of the logic and basic data that you're putting directly into smart contracts, and then you have decentralized file storage. And in most application stacks, when you think about storage and you think about business logic, there's a database in the middle. And the database handles a lot of things around more advanced data structures, uh, more uh, efficient query, and the ability to grab and use data um, the moment you need it in an application. But Web3 web developers were sort of building without it. Um, and it's not that they aren't building with a database. It's, it's that when people are building Web3 applications, they still need a database. Every great application you use has w at least one and probably multiple databases it's, it's using under the hood. So think you know, your Instagrams, your Twitters, your Notions. Um, all of them are using databases. And so when Web3 web developers are coming to this space and going, I want to build a great application, um, they've got their smart contract, they've got decentralized storage, um, and then they go and use a centralized provider for a database because they need that to build a great application. Um, and so the reason for this is, is kind of interesting. I, I have some like thoughts on the history of why there hasn't been a great database yet in Web3. And I, I think if you look out there and you look at database projects in the space, they've been there, um, but they're not quite solving exactly that need that I'm getting at for an application database. Um, so there's kind of early crypto, and we see like the OGs, um, like Big Chain DB was a real pioneer of databases in Web3 and, and actually went on to um, become the team behind Ocean, really because the database back then predated applications. It predated a lot of the developers that were going to need those types of tools. Um, and then we kind of entered the early Web3 period. And again, we saw a new class of databases. In fact, um, my organization built one of these early databases, or built um, more a protocol that helps run on top of databases called ThreadDB, which I know a bunch of you are familiar with. But I'd also say like a lot of early database-like networks started showing up. So um, the graph is a great example, where the graph is database-like, but it's not really an application database. And if you go to their website today, um, it's more of an indexing protocol and APIs for Web3, and less about that database interaction and um, building into your application stack. But what I think is really interesting about that period of databases in Web3 is they were addressing the data needs um, for a very blank canvas. Web3 didn't have things like structured data. It didn't have many people building on the same format of data even. And so if you think about what a graph database is good for, that's exactly what it's great for. You have a lot of unstructured data. A lot of application builders are coming with various needs and trying to experiment. And you can solve it with something like that. But then we entered the sort of NFT and post-NFT period of Web3. And what we saw with NFTs was actually the first case of highly structured data being used across Web3 applications. But if you actually dig into that too, the metadata for NFTs, if you just Google NFT metadata, I think the first link that's going to show up on everybody's search result is going to be the OpenSea metadata standard. 
Um, so we've only kind of loosely embraced that idea of structured data, and it's not really easy to evolve as a community. Um, and, but that's what get databases are really great at. Applications can actually propose their own structures of data, quickly change it into the format that the reader needs, and, and be able to build um, lots of composable applications on top of. Um, and that's kind of the period we're in now. Like now we can go beyond this um, structured JSON document being thrown around. Um, we can actually build with, uh, build, build with databases. And even more than that, there's a, really, um, there's a really emerging need for this database based on the data that applications are trying to, trying to store. So we're seeing tons of different projects in Web3 that are trying to build games. And if you think about a real Web3 game, it's not that you want to put all, it's not that the game needs to put all of its data into some Web3 native um, permissionless database, but it is a hybrid. You, they want to be able to put portions of that data in places that are tamper-proof, that are owned by users, that are composable. In other parts of it, they just want to be you know, probably fast and centralized and are less important. They're just about some basic application logic or things like that. But the first half of that, they're just really haven't been good solutions for. Social networks, similar case. Like all of these protocols that are starting to solve the actual um, the ne network component of the social layer, um, they have this need for a database, and the database should be holding this dynamic or mutable content that the, that the users of the social network are actually producing and creating and want to have some access control and ownership over. Uh, and then what an area that we're really excited about in this audience are things like data processing. So the ML, the AI, the ETL, the geospatial, like we just heard about. Um, there are lots of these cases where you it's actually coming from the other direction. A lot of these cases have gone to the decentralized storage first because that solves a big problem they have of where do they put these really big important data sets. But then if you think about the use cases that emerge on top of those data sets, they're almost all driven by smaller subsets of that data being in databases. So being able to quickly look up uh, what files hold what information or uh, in geospatial data being able to do intersects to say which of these images are describing this point in space. So before you even get to this, the storage network, you want to be able to find that information from a database. And so Tableland has really emerged to try to help solve this. Um, we're, we're really aiming to build a great database for Web3 developers that kind of can handle this, these varied use cases. And we do this by um, actually doing something quite different. Uh, the name Tableland really resonated with us because it has this sort of uh, retro feeling to it. And what we're trying to do is bring a really old, battle-tested database idea to Web3, which is the idea of a relational database. And what a relational database lets us do is provide developers the lingua franca of manipulating data, SQL, um, to uh, query, combine, and compose data sets that are stored across the Tableland network. Uh, and that gets really exciting, and, and I think that it can start to solve some of these points that I was bringing up before around letting the community drive different standards um, and let those standards sort of emerge, or, or more conventions emerge around how we're storing data that then can be used in applications across Web3. So a great example of this is we build an NFT called RIGS. The data that actually drives the metadata of RIGS is stored in a way that looks nothing like the OpenSea metadata standard for RIGS. But by querying the database, you can actually change that data on the fly to look like uh, NFT metadata. And that lets you do some really cool and powerful things to build on top of that data later. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of packing this database with a lot of other interesting features. Um, but so SQL's a big one. It's meant to be interoperable uh, and permissionless. So where we're going is that this is actually an infrastructure layer that uh, a decentralized network of nodes are going to host and provide uh, the, the database services around. So how do you query this data? How do you actually do that um, manipulation of data? Um, and it's right now, to use Tableland, you write SQL. Uh, so if you're writing an application in JavaScript, you, you write SQL in your front end. Um, if you're writing a smart contract, you write SQL in your smart contract. And what's really cool about that is that you can actually write smart contracts that create tables on the Tableland network. And the owner, the, the default access control for a table on the network is the address that created it, is the only address that can change it. So you can actually create tables on the network uh, from a smart contract where that smart contract is the only thing in the world that can change the data in that smart contract. 
So that makes it almost infinitely programmable how you want to um, modify and change data in the database. And so uh, there's plenty of examples in our docs of actually building like row and, and even cell level access control on top of the database. And again, back to the rigs example, we do this exactly in rigs where rigs owners can actually set different attributes of the NFT. And it doesn't mean they can change the full metadata payload that drives the NFT, but because they are the owner of the NFT, they can change specific attributes directly in the database. Um, and a lot of the use cases that are building on Tableland do this exactly. Um, I like to bucket the use cases uh, for Tableland into two really broad categories. There's the category of project. The first is the category of projects that are using data the database because it really simplifies the data management problem. So back to that point of the triangle where you have business logic in a smart contract, you have storage on the decentralized storage network, and then you have the database, the missing database. Well, any time a project needs to solve the database and they need to do it without a decentralized option, they need to actually put a credit card down, they need to open an account, they need to maintain that API and make sure it's always available. And then they need to figure out how to migrate data across those three points. But with Tableland existing at the sort of same layer as the smart contract and the decentralized storage, it makes it a much more complete story, a much easier story for them to flow data across the three. And then the second category are the ones that I was just mentioning around being able to program really nuanced controls over how data changes. And we have a lot of use cases that are popping up around this programmable access control. And for these, these are a lot of like games and NFT use, use cases where you want the ownership of an asset to actually change how somebody can interact with the information behind that asset. And so playable, uh, playable NFT is a, is a great sort of toy example where when you own the NFT, when you own an NFT that you might play in a game, the game doesn't want to give you complete ownership over all attributes of that NFT. Um, it needs to be sort of a divided uh, ownership where you might be able to change specific attributes of you know, what, uh, what weapon are you playing in this, in this level, but the admin of the game is going to control other attributes like what level are you on. And only by completing the game do you, does that admin get to tick up the, the levels. And so those sorts of like different controls and different data models are very easy to create in Tableland. Um, so under the hood, it's pretty, it's pretty simple to understand, but um, definitely check out our docs. You can think of it like the, the smart contract uh, that you're writing is actually going to interact with Tableland smart contracts to issue different events that change data. And then our network of validators are listening to those events for instructions on how to change data. And they validate those events sort of on two different principles. One is um, there's uh, the SQL language, and so it has to be valid SQL. Um, and then the second is the, the ownership. So that event has to actually come from the um, correct owner according to these rules. Um, the SQL piece is actually really interesting. We, under the hood, our network runs SQLite, if you're familiar with it, and this gives us a really um, great sort of foundation for a, a powerful database engine where you can run really advanced queries, you can merge data together, all of that good stuff, but it's not obviously designed for Web3. Um, and so there's some things that are really, uh, that are really challenging to support broadly in a database in Web3. So we actually have a um, SQL uh, spec that you can read, and it sort of limits that to just things that are supported in Web3. And so you'll see it. You, you can write SQL um, pretty, pretty broadly against table land, but there's some limits that you need to work within, and that, and, and that ensures that the data sort of maintains integrity and uh, all that good stuff. So they evaluate on those two things. And if they go through, the data is updated. Um, if you want to use it, like I said, it's, it's SQL everywhere. And so there's a bunch of different ways that you can uh, use the table and network. If you go to the docs, um, kind of those, those different five different options there with the arrow are uh, where you can get started. So you can download the CLI. And actually, um, you'll download the CLI, and you'll connect your wallet to the CLI. And you can start using the network um, as a single entity. And that's really great for a developer if you just want to push a data set that's going to be read by an application. Um, you can use smart contracts. And so we have an EVM library that you would just import into your um, development environment. And then you can start issuing commands against Tableland. We have the SDK for your front end development. Um, and local Tableland is like if you're building something locally, you can spin up a little mock network and it, uh, hit everything there. 
without network fees or anything. So the, what's next for Tableland? This is where all the exciting stuff is. So all of that, um, we've been off building that for the last um, 12 months, really trying to support uh, a lot of the popular EVMs out there. So you can use that on Ethereum, Polygon, Arbitrum, Optimism. And um, as of hopefully next week, the, uh, the, uh, the FEVM. And so our, our aim is to have that uh, out on Tuesday. And so the best place to keep up to date on that is either follow us on Twitter or check out our newsletter. There's one issue that we're hitting that's just kind of delaying that, which might get delayed a little bit further, but we're really hopeful that this gets out on um, Tuesday next week. But that means that you can do all that same stuff uh, that I've just mentioned now from smart contracts uh, on Filecoin. And for me, that gets really exciting um, for if you're sticking around for a talk, I think it's the next talk or, or maybe in two talks, around actually orchestrating storage deals from smart contracts in Filecoin. And the combination of, of being able to write smart contracts that are storing raw data and actually um, creating and modifying that sort of metadata layer in your database um, allows for you to start engineering really cool data pipelines or different application flows. Um, so I, I'm personally actually very excited to start playing around with this. If you're interested in really getting your hands on this early, we have, a, we have it actually on testnet already, but we're not making it available. But just um, um, shoot me a message or grab me, and we can get you set up to start playing with this early. Um, and, and actually, it was already uh, mentioned, we just, we just raised a round. So um, this round is really focused on a few things, but uh, one of the big ones is actually Filecoin. And so uh, one of the things that we're doing right now is ex exploring how to use Filecoin in a much deeper way. Um, that would expand sort of the use cases and the scalability of a database natively on top of this data. So look out for a lot of um, news there. We're also launching the studio. So the studio is really the place for you to come and build and uh, architect data uh, in these databases. And we're pretty excited about what this uh, might make possible. So a lot of people in Web3 have been interested in this idea of composable data. Um, but as I mentioned before, Web3 until recently, has been mostly this blank canvas of data. And I, and I kind of come from this belief that um, a highly structured database can actually lead to more composable data by actually making the models for the data composable. So allowing those um, community conventions to start to emerge around what formats of data we're even storing and requesting and um, building as developers. And the studio is, is really going to expose a lot of cool tools for that. Um, and so just to like, anchor that in some reality. If you think about community standards in Web3 around data formats and structures, the, the, like even the conventions are hard to find. Um, and one of the only examples I can actually put a finger on is that NFT one I already, I already gave you. But we can see a lot of these other, these other domains of development in Web3 that are actually really lacking those uh, shared data models. And because of that, it, it might actually be slowing down development. And so um, one concrete example of that are DAOs. And so what are the data formats, what are the data structures of DAOs that make them repeatable so that you can go to any DAO and be able to look at memberships, roles, a, a, any of the other metadata that drives that DAO? Um, they, lack those, they lack those conventions today. And so that actually makes it hard to, la to layer tools on top of DAOs in useful ways across all DAOs. And so um, a database to drive that, I think, gets really exciting. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find me on Twitter. Definitely check out our site for um, our, our docs. And uh, yeah, I, I, have, I have stickers for all of you. Great. Well, thanks for that, Andrew. Um, we've, we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule now, which is not normal. But um, so if anybody has any questions for Andrew, um, we could take a couple if um, <laughs> don't sneak away quite yet. Uh, if there's any, any um, I have one. Uh, this is pretty cool. We actually looked a lot at like doing decentralized database stuff, and even a year ago, it was like almost impossible to do something in production. Uh, how are you looking at the privacy stuff? I know a lot of like enterprises and businesses don't want that data to be public, and I know that's still a challenge today on a lot of decentralized pretty much anything. How, how do you guys look at that in terms of privacy, or is this more focused on public uh, data sets? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So the question. Yeah, so 
I don't know, I might have a controversial point of view here, but I feel like Web3 might not be ready for private quite yet. And I, I think a lot of projects are getting us there. So because, because we're not quite there yet, we've really focused on the open and really thinking that, that private, the private piece is something that um, we'll build into, but also we hope we'll layer on top of Tableland through integrations with a lot of these other projects that are, that are emerging, like you know, imagining um, ZK things running on or under Tableland gets really exciting to me. Um, but also related to some of that work that I'm mentioning around um, going deeper in Filecoin, I'm sure that there's gonna be cases of like entire you know, private databases that are running on Tableland, but we're just not there yet.